before I say one word about Pasolini, I want to preface by warning you. Uh, it, yes, it did take me 10 years to write his biography, and it took 800 pages. And it took 800 pages because he crammed into a life of 53 years about as much as most people would need for three lives. The man made more than a dozen movies. He published a handful of books, not one or two, but more like four or five books of poetry, several books of literary criticism and philosophical theory, two major novels. He was a constant uh, columnist in the leading newspapers and magazines of the country. He did it all at the same time, and it was like a whirlwind. And I'm going to reduce it to one hour, which is impossible. The only way that I know how to do it uh, is for much of what I say to be read to you. Because to just extemporize, even if you're good at it, doesn't make sense. There's too much detail. I want to tell you too much about it. And I appreciate your patience as this happens. Now this man you see up there on the slide, this very intense looking man, is Pier Paolo Pasolini. The photo was taken sometime in October 1975. That means about two weeks before his murder. Had he lived, the following February, he would have turned only 54. The intensity of the gaze you see here was earned over a lifetime. By the time this photograph was taken, his name was a household word. You only had to say Pier Paolo, and everybody knew who that was. I don't want to cheapen the, the analogy, but it would be like Giorgio for Giorgio Armani, something like that, or Sophia for Sophia Loren. You didn't have to say his full name. That's how household word and famous he was. He also generated very strong opinions, very, very much so. There were people who considered him a prophet. Here's a newspaper clipping. I have dozens of them like this from a Sicilian newspaper that says, a prophet misunderstood. That's the headline, a misunderstood prophet. That's part of what you, those who followed him thought of him. That he was a great man, a genius, an important intellectual, and a prophet not understood in his own country. And there were many other people for whom he was simply a pederast and a pornographer. And that's it. Said that bluntly. And that's what they said, that bluntly. Now, when he died, all the two groups came to the fore and, and did battle. Uh, this is a poster that was put up on the walls of streets of Rome. At the bottom, you see Federazione Romana, FGE Federazione. That is the Youth Federation of the Communist Party of Italy. <laughs> and what you see here is somebody has written Coprallo, which means goat buggerer. <laughs> and you see up there it says pig three. So instead of PPP, Pier Paolo Pasolini, pig, pig, pig. <laughs> Okay? You see where it says, I comunisti romani, amico vero compagno. This happened spontaneously. So the poster was made by the supporters, and in this case, one supporter, there were many people who felt this way, defaced it. I want to show you a little more. This is an important picture. This is the site where they found his body, and what happened was the people who lived in the neighborhood got a bunch of, of, of stones, cinder blocks, and made this circle. And with a can of paint, this dripping, very homemade, Pier P. Pasolini. Let me tell you about who these people are. The man in the double-breasted suit uh, with his hand out, gesturing. In from the right, one, two, three, the fourth person, is a judge. His name is Alfonso Moro. His brother was Aldo Moro, who became prime minister later on. Alfonso Moro spent his career as a judge in juvenile courts. And the trial of the young man who was arrested and charged with Pasolini's murder happened in his court because that person was 17 years old and was a minor. The man in the check jacket who's scratching his ear is the lawyer for that young man. His name, the lawyer's name is Rocco Manja. And the 
head in between the two of them is a lawyer representing Pasolini's family. And as part of the trial, the judge said, I want to go to the site. I want to go there and see where, where it happened and do a walk around. And this picture was taken then and there. This is the coffin. And the man on the far left is Bernardo Bertolucci. Bernardo mm -hmm. Bertolucci, the filmmaker, owes his career to Pasolini. <coughs> when Pasolini made his first movie, which will be screened here tomorrow, Acatone, in 1961, uh, Bernardo Bertolucci, who was a kid of about 16 or 17, and hung around on the set. The way he got there to hang around on the set was that his father, Attilio Bertolucci, is an important literary critic in Italy who played a very key role in launching Pasolini as a writer. It is Bertolucci's father who introduced Pasolini to the man who became his publisher. On the other side, on the far right, the man holding the rumpled raincoat is Ninetto Davoli. Ninetto Davoli was a great love of Pasolini's life uh, and the great sadness of his life in that he was not homosexual and he married and had children and Pasolini lived a great drama when that happened. And this is the um, coffin which was placed in the headquarters of the Roman <coughs> Communist Party headquarters in, in their building. And for a day and a half, people walked through and signed a condolences book. Here we see them carrying the coffin outside. And you see Bertolucci is there. You see Ninetto Davoli. And behind Ninetto Davoli is an actor named Ettore Garofalo. And Ettore Garofalo was the star of Pasolini's second movie called Mama Roma, released in 1962. Luckily, there are metal bands keeping it closed because it would have fallen to the ground. This is a square called the Campo dei Fiori in the center of Rome, the center of the center of Rome. And every morning, there's a fruit and vegetable market there. Uh, it's famous because in the center of the square is a statue of Giordano Bruno, and Giordano Bruno was a political figure. He was a monk who got involved in medieval politics in Rome and was burned on that spot. And there's a statue of Giordano Bruno there in the middle of that square. And this is what happened. The word went out that there was going to be this funeral, and tens of thousands of people appeared. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, and the coffin kind of floated hand to hand. It was, it was packed hand to hand. And apparently, there were moments that people I interviewed when people thought, we're going to lose control of this thing. It's going to, we're, it's going to take off and crash to the ground. And it barely didn't. <laughs> There is an epigram from a very famous German philosopher who you might think would have nothing to do with Pasolini, but I think has everything to do with him. The philosopher is named Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche, in 1886, said something about Pasolini that I want you to keep in mind as we talk. Nietzsche said the following. He said, terrible experiences pose the riddle whether the person who has had them is not terrible. Terrible experiences pose the riddle whether the person who has had them is not terrible. That means, I think what he's saying here is, if you meet somebody who has survived a terrible accident, a plane crash, or a fire, or something awful has happened in their lives, you know, they were injured in a war, or mutilated, or tortured, or something like that, these terrible things that have happened to them make them have an aura that frightens people or draws them toward them. They're different from everybody else. There is something terrible about them. And by the way, the word terrible in English means bad, but its ancient origins are that it stimulates terror. Not that it's bad, but that it's scary, which is not exactly the same thing. So I think Pasolini is someone to whom so much happened that was terrible that it may have made him terrible. 
In this picture, you see four people. On the left, the little boy in the white shorts is named Guidalberto, and he's Pazla Pierpaolo's younger brother. The lady sitting down with the interesting fur garment is Susanna Colusi Pasolini, his mother. Pierpaolo's on the right, wearing boots and a turtleneck kind of sweater. And the woman standing up is his aunt, probably his aunt Enriqueta. He had two aunts, Janina and Enriqueta. That, I think, is Aunt Enriqueta, a close sister, a lifelong close sister to the woman sitting down, Susanna. What happened was, on December 21st, 1921, less than a year before Benito Mussolini and his fascist movement came to power in Italy, an army lieutenant named Carlo Alberto Pasolini married an elementary school teacher named Susanna Colusi. They lost a first child during their engagement, and Pierpaolo was born three weeks, three months, I'm sorry, after the wedding. <coughs> the groom was a man unusually punctilious about rank, discipline, and order, and claimed to be descended from a noble family from Ravenna, fallen on hard times. The bride, more convincingly, came from a clan of prosperous farmers. They were called the Colus, who had settled in far northeastern Italy in a region called Friuli, and they had been there for about 500 years. The romantic, sentimental Susanna and the reticent, often angry Carlo Alberto quarreled early and often and grew apart. She took refuge in her extended family, and he took to drink. In the strife, Pierpaolo sided completely with his mother. He even said that he sided with her monstrously so. The two, the mother and the firstborn, formed an impenetrable an exclusive duo that lasted as long as they both lived. He starred at school, even at the many schools he had to attend because Carlo's army postings moved him around. He won a ribbon for his first composition and claimed to interviewers later that he'd written his first poem for his mother when he was seven. By age 15, he was noticeably excelling at the best high school in Bologna, and thriving with soccer buddies and classmates who also loved literature. By 17, he was enrolled at the Bologna University Faculty of Letters. He would go on long bicycle rides with his friends, he went skiing, always played soccer on Sundays. He devoured historical literature and contemporary writers, especially the Hermetic School, headed by Giuseppe Ungaretti. He devoured the enlightened virtues of the university, kept quiet about politics, and frequented a film club that screened the French directors René Clair and Jean Renoir, and the officially banned Charlie Chaplin. Here you see him, I think, at about the age of university, rather nonchalant and elegant with the jacket thrown over his shoulders. He was always a good dresser, cared about it clothing, spent a lot of time on it, uh, holding a glass, papers in front of him, a pair of glasses, I think, spectacles on the table, looking right at you, absolutely confident. While he was at the university, he made a crucial cultural connection because he found a mentor in an art historian named Roberto Longhi. This enormously erudite scholar created over decades a school of disciples, starting as far back as 1934. He taught the old masters and the contemporaries, like Morandi, and is credited with rediscovering Caravaggio for the world, for an exhibition he curated in the early 50s. The young Pasolini, enrolled in the Faculty of Letters but taking courses from this art historian as well, absorbed everything. Masaccio, Masolino, Rosso Fiorentino, Pontormo, the early Renaissance, through Baroque, Mannerism, and Longhi loved cinema, and he talked about it with the same seriousness that he did the great art of the Renaissance. The war began, and the universities were closed. So Pasolini returned to 
the village, I suppose it's a small town, of his mother called Kazarsa in Friuli. There, in the house on the main street, they spoke a Veneto-accented Veneto Italian, although his father didn't like it and thought they should speak proper Italian the way the regime wanted it to be. Pierpaolo began studying the dialect of the farmers and the field hands and found that there was a separate language, completely different from Italian, called Friulano. He approached it like an ethnographer. He interviewed people and said, how do you say this? How do you say that? How is that written? He took notes. In 1943, when he was 21, all hell broke loose in Italy. On July 25th of that year, Mussolini was deposed and his successor government sought peace terms with the Allies. Hitler unleashed his, former, his army on his former ally, and the partisan group splintered into those who were in favor of a communist party and those who were linked with what became the Christian Democrats. Pasolini was drafted on September 1st. By the 8th, Italy's truce with the Allies took effect. His unit was seized by the Germans and marched toward the trains for deportation to Germany. He recounts years later that he and another soldier jumped into a ditch and ran, and ran, and ran. And that ended his encounter with the war. The struggle of World War II took another form, however, for his younger brother Guido, who had gone up into the mountains as a partisan. His unit was pinned down by communist partisans, and there was some confusion about who was giving what orders. The argument, which is a little bit arcane, was like this. There were those in the northeast of Italy who wanted that part of Italy to merge with Yugoslavia, with Tito. And there were others who absolutely insisted that that not happen and were not anti-clerical. And the partisan groups fought each other as hard as they fought the Nazis. And they killed Guidalberto. He was 20. So this is Susanna left with only one son. Later, 20 years later, but it might as well have been a thousand, Pierpaolo wrote a poem to his mother about all of that. And I'm going to tell it to you with apologies in advance for my lack of skill. He wrote, you alone in all the world know what love has come first in my heart. That is why there's something terrible you should know. It is from your grace that springs my sorrow. You are irreplaceable. That is why the love you blessed me with always has condemned me to loneliness. And I don't want to be alone. I have an infinite thirst for love, for bodies pure and soulless. For the soul is in you. It is you, but you are my mother and in your love are my fetters. I went through childhood enslaved to a sentiment, lofty and incurable, of overwhelming commitment. It is the only way to feel alive, the only color, the only <coughs> form, and now it's over. Still, we survive in the confusion of a life born outside of reason. I beg you, oh, I beg you, don't wish for death. I'm here alone with you in an April to come. He found a shack in a field that nobody was using, and because the primary and secondary schools had been disrupted, it was unsafe to travel by train, he started a little academy there, and his friends would become the teachers. The students were the children of farmhands, the offspring of illiterate parents, and he taught them poetry and Italian and Greek and Latin. On July 14, 1942, he would have been 20, he paid to have printed 300 copies of a booklet called Poesia a Casarsa, Poetry at Casarsa. And he set aside 75 of the 300 copies for the critics. He's 20 years old, 
There aren't 75 critics in Italy, and he certainly doesn't know them. But along the way, he had come to think of himself as someone who could do such a thing. One of the things that's fascinating about learning about him is the insights it can offer on the nature of ambition. Uh, Pasolini seems never to have suffered what lesser folks call writer's block. If he th had an idea, it was in words. And if it was in words, it was written down. Every day, no problem. Utterly fearless. What he did with the little booklet was he mailed a copy to a faculty member whom he knew from Bologna, named Gianfranco Contini. Gianfranco Contini is a god figure in certain Italian literary circles because he's the great father of philology, the study of Romance languages. Gianfranco Contini was fighting from exile in Switzerland for the s sustaining and flourishing of Italian dialects and regional language at a time when the official line of the regime was there's only one Italian, and we we're all going to speak it. Uh, this happens in many countries. It happened in Spain under Franco. Franco banned the speaking and writing of Catalan. Contini actually wrote back and said, this is a wonderful book. May I review it? And pretty soon, word was out in the region and in a network that a young poet in Casarsa was somebody to watch. Pasolini said that Cotini's approval was, quote, the greatest literary joy of my life. That was at 20 years old. And happened when he mailed a copy to Contini. <coughs> By now, Carlo Alberto, Pasolini's father, was fighting in Africa. And before he was taken prisoner by the English, he was reward, rewarded the regime's silver medal for valor in the field of battle. He still believed in the eventual victory of fascism. Meanwhile, Pasolini went on long bicycle rides in the countryside. And when he saw an adolescent, he stopped and talked to him. And sometimes his offer of sex was accepted. Sometimes he saw the same boy again. His notebooks mention a boy named Bruno and a blonde boy, but usually not. The war, and especially its chaotic aftermath, galvanized him. Was Italy going to be a kind of pawn of the allies of Great Britain and England? Were the Americans going to buy themselves an anti-communist regime in Rome? Or was it going to be a worker's paradise, a new place of fairness and justice. This was all going to be fought out among Italians as the German troops, the American troops, the British troops depart. He wanted to be a poet and he wanted to teach, but he also wanted to be a protagonist, a very important word in Italian, a protagonista, someone who counts, a player, a contender, in politics. He enlisted in the local cell of the Communist Party and began to compose posters that were manifestos. He was arrested once for distributing anti-fascist leaflets actually written by Guido. At the same time, he started a little magazine that published poetry and prose in Friulano. He was a man of letters, rooted in privacy, and yet he was also a protagonist in the public debate. They were born together. He joined the Communist Party, which is the party of those who had murdered Guido. He saw it as the proper home for an intellectual interested in liberation, anti-clericalism, and sympathetic to a populist idealism. It was, he felt, the party with the purest anti-fascist credentials. After all, Mussolini had declared the Communist Party illegal. It was underground. He could have stayed where he was in Kazarsa. He had many friends, a loving, happy, a loving family, happy to see him spend his life there where all of his ancestors were buried, in the little churchyard at the end of the town 
marked by a pair of cypresses on either side of the gate. In fact, there is instead a different path. There's an ancient stone loggia, a, a kind of sh shack with arches, in the village of San Giovanni, a tiny community a few miles from Casarsa. And Pasolini became secretary of the cell of this mini village called San Giovanni di Casarsa. The walls of the loggia were like a community bulletin board. Pasolini began to compose manifestos, both in Italian and in dialect. Had there been magic markers, that's what he would have used. He used pen and ink on big sheets of paper. Put glue on the back, slapped them up at night, and then got on his bicycle and rode away. People would wake up the next morning and find them. One of them criticized Pope Pius XII, who had excommunicated communists. Another attacked the Christian Democrats, Dem Democrats who claimed a monopoly on religious feeling and practice. This was 1949, and Pasolini was working on a theory that would allow for Marxism without being intolerant, and Christianity without siding with a church that for too many decades seemed always to side with the rich against the poor. He tried to occupy that space as a public intellectual. The wall posters of 1949 made this soft-spoken 27-year-old a recognized political figure in the region, somebody who was known to the police, who was known to the political opposition, and known to the church hierarchy. The US agreed to make a large loan but insisted the communists be kept out of the cabinet. And the church made an unbiased, uh, unashamed alliance with the far right. There were collaborators. They should be punished. But as the fascist regime lasted 21 years, who had not been compromised in that much time? And now this school teacher was using all the oratorial skills at his command to promote the left. There are photos of him standing with the fellow members of the committee who rule the uh, cell in San Giovanni. The problem was he was not a good party man. He wasn't good at following the party line. So what he wrote was something that upset them. He wrote that the communist literary man should be completely free to do as he liked in literature and still remain a loyal comrade in politics. The difficulty for, with this is that the party wanted a cultural line. It wanted people to depict the struggle of workers and peasants made successful by their adhesion to the Italian Communist Party. And he wanted complete freedom as an artist to say what he wanted to say and yet still be a good communist. What was happening was, and we can see this in retrospect, the pieces were coming together for an explosion because his private life kept secret and his public life causing opposition were about to collide. In 1950, when it was all over, he wrote to his closest female friend, a woman named Silvana Maori. He wrote her this letter. He wrote, I was born to be calm, balanced, and natural. My homosexuality was something added. It lay outside. It had nothing to do with me. I've always seen it as something beside me, like an enemy. I've never felt it to be within me. But he was prepared to live a double life. He also wrote to her, I live <laughs> delicious subterfuges, perfectly happy to be hidden. But he wasn't going to stay hidden because of what happened in a place called Ramuscello. Ramuscello is just a hamlet near Casarza. It's nothing more than a collection of houses. There's no there there. On the outskirts of that village, there's a police station in a town called Cordovado, which is only itself a widening in the road. On September 30th, 1949, the locals in Ramuscello 
celebrated the feast day of their patron saint, Saint Sabina. So a platform was set up, and Pasolini went there to drink and dance like everybody else. Some months before, it seems there had been an attempted blackmail by a local priest. The demand was that Pasolini give up his political life. And a Christian Democratic member of parliament had passed along the suggestion that Pierpaolo stop making wall posters. Occasionally, he was condemned from church pulpits, not on religious grounds, but political ones. In Ramuschello that evening, he struck up a conversation with three boys aged 16, 15, and 14. They agreed to meet in a field, and after some mutual masturbation, the boys fell to fighting among themselves, assigning blame. What happened reached the ears of the local police, and even though the parents did not file lawsuits, a magistrate in San Vito charged Pasolini and the 16-year-old with corruption of minors and lewd acts in public. Corruption of minors and lewd acts in public. That was three weeks after the event. It took until December 1950, long after everybody had heard about it, for the first charges to be dropped because the parents did not come forward. Later, the Commission of Lewd Acts charge was dropped because the encounter took place not exactly in the open, but hidden by a small woods, a bunch of trees. The case dragged on for another two years. But the damage was already done in the autumn of 1949 well ahead of the first verdict of several, which only came in January of 1950. It didn't do him any good denying the facts. He admitted them and naively said that he was doing research in line with the writings of the recent Nobel Prize winner for literature named André Gide. He referred, in his police report, the police report refers to an erotic experiment of literary origin and character stimulated by reading of a novel on a homosexual subject by Jeet, because the police had never heard of Jeet, so they misspelled his name. The large circulation newspapers in the region got a hold of his deposition, the one that talked about Jeet, and they published articles. And in fact, the newspapers were sold, come and get it, today's news, under the window of the family house. His action and the scandal were almost literally shouted from the rooftops. His father, by now diagnosed as paranoid, came home with a newspaper in his hand. The headlines were, Professor charged with immorality. And another was, A serious charge against a man of letters. His enemies were emboldened and did their worst, and his world collapsed quickly. He was immediately expelled from the party for moral and political unfitness. He wrote to a senior party functionary, saying, I will always remain a communist, but it did no good. And a school which had just renewed his contract fired him immediately. Desperation set in. Carlo Alberto blamed Susanna and Susanna locked herself in a room. People pointed at him on the street. Even giving private lessons proved impossible. The Friuli that had seemed to embrace him now turned against him. He was marked for exclusion. He wrote to the former party chief, I am left alone with the mortal pain of my father and my mother. The wound festered from the end of September through January and the situation grew, if anything, worse at home. Life became impossible. Finally, in the dark, at five in the morning, on January 28, 1950, Pierpaolo and Susanna left the house without waking Carlo Alberto and made their way to the Gazarza train station and departed for Rome. She carried her jewelry, incorrectly thinking it was valuable and might bring some money. He carried the manuscript of a novel 
about a laborer's uprising in San Vito and poems that later became a book entitled The Nightingale of the Catholic Church. By the time those, that book of poetry was published, publishers would have been happy to print a grocery list if he had written it. <laughs> Susanna had a brother, Gino, who was established with a successful shop in Rome. He found lodging for his sister and his nephew with a policeman's family, their name was Castaldi, in the Jewish ghetto. They stayed there about 18 months. In 1966, 16 years later, when he was already respected as a poet and famous as a filmmaker, he wrote about those days. He said, I lived like someone who was condemned to death, always with that worry, like something born, carried, dishonor, unemployment, misery. My mother was reduced for a time to being a servant. In fact, she went to work as a housemaid and companion to a family in Ferrara. It only lasted a short time. While she was there, she wrote him letters in which she referred to his genius. One of the other fascinating lessons about studying Pasolini, besides learning about the nature of ambition, is about the relationship between mothers and sons. Uh, Arthur, Douglas MacArthur, the five-star general who was emperor of Japan after the war, uh, was told by his mother that he was a genius. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mother, who lived in the White House until she died, told him he was a genius. Uh, there, there's something going on here. <laughs> and, and Susanna did it. Susanna did it. She just knew. She just felt that way. And she told him so. And he was young enough and impressionable enough to believe her. When Carlo Alberto joined them in mid-1951, they moved to a hovel, a shack on the far outskirts of the city, and half of his paltry salary went for rent. It was here that he began what he called his real poetic work. And he wrote again to Silvana Maury to confess some more. He said, someone normal can resign himself, what a terrible word, to chastity, to missed chances. But in me, the difficulty of loving has made the need to love obsessive. <clears throat> he tells her, my future will surely not be that of a university professor. By now there is upon me the sign of Rambeau or Campana. Campana is an Italian poet who died at 20. Suicide. Not suicide, he drank himself to death, actually. And also of Wilde, whether I want it or not, whether I accept it or not. I have suffered the sufferable, but I have never accepted my sin. I have never come to terms with my nature, and I am not even used to it. He told her, in the same letter, that he was at work on three novels, writing 10 hours a day. 16 years later, in 1966, when everything had happened and everything had changed, he wrote this in a poem. We lived in a house without a roof, without plaster, a poor people's house at the city's far edge next to a jail, a dust bowl in summer, a swamp in winter, but it was Italy, naked and swarming Italy, with its boys, its women, its smell of jasmine and poor soup, sunsets on the fields of Agnene, piles of trash, and as for me, my poetry dreams intact, in poetry, a solution to everything. It seemed to me that Italy, its description and destiny, depended on what I wrote about it. In lines infused with immediate reality, no longer no <coughs> nostalgic, as if I had earned it with my sweat. Never mind that on certain days, I didn't have a hundred lira for a shave. Italy invented opera, and if this were the opera Pier Paolo Pasolini, I would bring down the curtain now at the end of Act One. But there is Act Two. The next 25 years, and that is what remained for him from the trip, flight to Rome in 1950, he was murdered in 1975, 
many 25 years, were years of prodigious, nonstop work. He simply changed gears between media. There was writing of all kinds, poetry and novels and short stories and book reviews and polemical essays for newspapers and anthologies to be edited, and that doesn't count his career as a film director. And he did them all at the same time. Was there, I ask, a single theme, anything that unifies all this work, that runs through and across it? The answer is that it is non-conforming, challenging, and accusing. Here was someone able to write an epigram in a prestigious magazine criticizing the church, attacking Paul uh, Pius XII, and then he turned around and dedicated the Gospel according to Matthew to the memory of John the Twenty-Third, and saw it declared by the Catholic Church as the most beautiful and important religious film made to date. He spoke against the Communist Party, but said he was a communist. He spoke against the students in 1968 because they were the spoiled sons of the haves, and the police were the real proletariat, the real working class. He wrote that abortion ought to be banned because life was what he called, how could he use such a word, sacred. He blasted obligatory education in state schools, attacked television and courtship and marriage, and he called for the trial and imprisonment of the entire Italian political class. One can only wonder what he would have said about the kidnapping and murder of Prime Minister Aldo Moro at the hands of the far left. And what would he say about Berlusconi? And what would he make of Pope Francis? What connects and unifies all of this, I would propose to you, is fearlessness. The behavior of someone untouchable, who is beyond <laughs> dreading the opinion of others and beyond needing their acceptance or their approval. How can this be? How does someone become that way? I think, at the risk of being a pop psychologist, that it came from Ramushawa. The world had done its worst to him there. And like someone who survives a deadly illness or injury, he was now immune and shielded. What could be worse than ha what happened then, having his teaching position stripped away, his membership in the party revoked, a scandal in the newspapers shouted under the windows of his parents' house. The only way to hurt him, to silence him, would be to kill him. When he arrived in Rome in 1950, he hit the ground running. Already by March of that year, he had published a book review in the literary page of a Roman newspaper almost immediately. In 1964, after he had published several books of poetry and two novels and was directing his third film, by that time he looked back on his first year in Rome and he said this, he wrote this poem, I work all day like a monk and at night wander around like an alley cat looking for love. I'll propose to the church that I be made a saint. <laughs> He found a new paradise, a new Arcadia, to take the place of Friuli. The boys from the villages along the river Tagliamento, left behind when he had fled, now became the slum kids of the new post-war Roman periphery of housing projects where there were no prospects. He said it was a world he discovered and it left him amazed. Even in 1950, and continuing in 51, and several years thereafter, he wrote short stories set in those slums and about those boys. He studied their slang and their dialect and worked it into the mouths of his characters. These short stories are full of references to tracking shots and close up and pan. They read like film scripts a decade before he made his first film. And 
they were processed and reprocessed because the characters and the scenes in those short stories fed into and became his two novels, one of 1955 and one of 1959. His passion for these boys and his appropriation or attempted appropriation into himself of their world happened at the same time. He asks, where does Trust Avery end and the boy begin? Where does Trust Avery end and the boy begin? And the answer is, he didn't know, and he loved them both. The boys of Friuli became the boys of Rome, whom he called tattered in the elegant way of Romans. He identified with them. He wanted to be accepted by them, even if their directness and violence shocked him, because he could never be like them. He was the bourgeois son of an intellectual schoolmistress, and he couldn't become a kid of the slums. He needed a guide, and he found that in Sergio Chiti and his brother Franco. The Chitis translated slang for him, and he said of Sergio Chiti that he is my tape recorder. In this world, the Roman slums and their inhabitants, he found his subject, and he came at it with meticulous description. The short stories of the very first months in Rome included one that appeared in a small circulation but influential magazine called Paragone, edited by Roberto Longhi. It appeared in 1951. The next thing you knew, he was introduced by a literary scout named Attilio Bertolucci, whose son Bernardo, to a young publisher named Livio Garzanti. Bertolucci said to Garzanti, you're a young publisher, you need writers. I know this young writer, he needs a publisher. You two should meet. They met in a hotel, they chatted briefly. Garzanti said, it should be a film. Garzanti said, well, what do you make? He was, you know, rough businessman. What do you earn? Pasolini cited some paltry figure that he got as a school teacher, elementary school teacher. He said, I'll double it. And here's the deadline. Bring me the book. And that be happened in the spring of 1953. So with, by the end of three years in Rome, having arrived with absolutely nothing, not 100 lira for a shave, living in a shack in a house without plaster and no roof, he had a book contract. The novel was called Ragazzi di Vita, and the protagonist of it was a boy named Ricetto. The book caused a scandal. Why? Because the conservatives thought it obscene. Ricetto does not speak very elegantly. And the Communist Party believed in socialist realism, and they weren't happy with a novel that glorified ne'er-do-wells who never see the light and join the Communist Party. The ricettos of this world were not going to build the workers' paradise. But in Pasolini's eyes, such characters were the repository of values superior to those of the bourgeoisie and superior to those, of those values which he believed were the corrosive values of capitalism. So he put it all together. The struggling survivors in the Borgata noble in their poverty, excluded from the economic boom, his erotic drive, and the humanistic values found in the early writings of Karl Marx. Finally, a friend got him a position teaching children between ages 11 and 13, and he stayed in that school until 1953. He was able to move his parents into another house and Susanna could stop working as a servant for another family. And he got himself a union card at Chinichita, the National Film Studios, which allowed him to work as an extra. With hindsight, we can see that everything was now happening to him that was important at the same time, between 1950 and 55. Garzanti's money allowed him to move Susanna and Carlo Alberto yet again this time into a middle-class apartment. Carlo Alberto liked it and said, at least here the trash is collected on time. Pasolini also made a crucial step into the Roman cinema world. The producer Carlo Ponti had conduct, concocted a vehicle 
for his 19-year-old discovery and mistress, a certain Sophia Loren. It was called La Donna del Fiume, the river girl, and it featured Loren dancing a mambo in a very tight sweater. That's all the movie needed, but there was a role for a cigarette smuggler who needed to talk like a tough guy. Giorgio Bassani was already on a writing team with Alberto Moravia, Alberto Moravia who only wrote about the rich bourgeoisie of Rome, <laughs> and Giorgio Bassani who was an elegant, refined man who wrote The Garden of the Finzi Contini that became a well-known film. They didn't know how to write, put words in the mouth of somebody who smuggled cigarettes for a living. So they brought in Pier Paolo. He was now writing real dialogue for a proper movie and at the same time finishing a novel. It was 1954. As his success grew with publications and prizes, there emerged a complicated dynamic that I want to talk to you about because it was a very special kind of success. He was intent on having success, yes, but on terms that were unique, strictly of his own making. This has been described very well by Stephen Sartorelli, who's the editor and translator of Pasolini's poetry in the book that I hope is available outside. And this is what Sartorelli said. He said that Pasolini had an uncanny ability to use existing institutions, public, private, literary, stylistic, and so on, to successful ends while undermining them from within and without. He, Pasolini, called this his, quote, endless capacity for obedience and endless capacity for rebellion. Contradiction and paradox were his stock in trade. My message is this. To understand and enter into the phenomenon that is Pier Paolo Pasolini, you have to set aside conventional logic and give up on demanding consistency. His way of knowing, he said, was, and I quote, in the eternal coexistence of opposites. No wonder his contemporaries found him exasperating. As Oscar Wilde once said of himself, I was a problem for which there was no solution. We have here a communist who celebrated the rituals of the Catholic Church and said he had nostalgia for its faith. A revolutionary who refused to align himself with 1968 and a homosexual at odds with the political correctness of sexual equality. I think that what I'm going to do now is tell you two of his most interesting epigrams and then show you some slides. Uh, he was always starting and editing small magazines. And as he became more famous, the magazines became more prestigious and more important. And at a certain point, uh, he was the editor of one called Officina, which means workshop. It was in the 1950s, late 50s. And he wrote an epigram on the death of Pius XII, and it was called To a Pope. And I want to read it for you. He wrote, no one ever asked you to pardon Marx an immense wave breaking from millennia of life separated you from him, from his religion. But in your religion, don't they speak of mercy? Thousands of people under your pontificate before your eyes lived in stalls and pigsties. You knew it. To sin does not mean to do evil, not to do good. That's what it means to sin. How much good you could have done, and you did not do it. There has never been a greater sinner than you. The result of that poem was that the publisher shut down the magazine. <laughs> so you say, well, if he's going to attack the church, surely he's going to support the anti-church religion of Marxism. This is what he wrote about Italian Marxists. 
They are inflexible. They are gloomy in their judgment of you. Those who wear hair shirts can't forgive. From them you can't expect a crumb. A crumb of mercy. Between the publication of Ragazzi di Vita and the appearance four <coughs> years later in 1959 of a second novel, said in the Borgata, he wrote for the cinema, and he wrote what was perhaps his most important poetry. The title poem was of a book published in 1957 called Gramsci's Ashes. The work allowed Pasolini to meet Alberto Moravia, who was editor of a magazine called Novi Argumenti, where Pasolini hoped to see that poem printed. In fact, an exception was made, and it did appear in the magazine. He became great friends with Moravia, and they traveled together in later years to India and Africa together. Nestor Said is going to do justice to the ashes of Gramsci, but I want to give you just a little tiny bit of it. In the title poem, Pasolini addresses the ghost, that is, the ashes, of Antonio Gramsci, the founder of the Italian Communist Party, a man locked up by Mussolini and made by Mussolini into a martyr. Gramsci is buried in Rome's so-called Protestant cemetery. It's also called the non-Catholic cemetery. It's also called the cemetery of the English. The reason it's called the cemetery of the English is that both Keats and Shelley are buried there. Like a great symphonic overture or first movement, Pasolini sets the scene by invoking nature itself as a protagonist, and then moves quickly on to politics and history. He writes, it's not May that brings this impure air, makes the darkness of the foreign garden darker still. Between these old walls, the autumn May extends a deathly peace as unloved as our destinies. It carries all the grayness of the world, the close of a decade where we saw our keen Naive attempts to remake life end up among the ruins of a sodden, sterile silence. In other words, the dream of the Italian left ended up in Stalin's attack on Hungary in 1956 and the return of capitalism. Pasolini, because he is bourgeois, is conscious of history. He believes that it is people of property who make history, make things happen. And the subproletariat in the Borgata are people to whom history happens, but do not make it themselves. So he wrote that he lived in a scandal of self-contradiction, of being with you, Gramsci, and against you. With you in my heart, in the light, the light of rationality, and against you in the dark of my gut. The poem then becomes a film. Soon it will be time for dinner. The few running buses glitter in the dark. Clusters of workers hang out the doors. Groups of soldiers, in no particular rush, head to the mount where between ruddy dirt heaps and dry pieces of rubbish in shadow hide little whores, angrily waiting at the top of the aphrodisiac filth. Not far away, between illegal shanties, at the edge of the hill, or between buildings like other worlds, kids light as rags play in a spring breeze no longer cold. Poor things, enjoying the evening, helpless, yet in them and for them, myth is reborn in all its power, but I, with the conscious heart of one who lives only in history, can I ever act with pure passion again when I know that our history has ended. The Chain of Gramsci was published by Garzanti in 1957, and the first edition sold out in 15 days. Italo Calvino, a critic whose opinion already mattered, wrote that the poem was one of the most important events in Italian literature since the end of the war, and certainly the most important in the field of poetry. Garzanti was sometimes late with payments for the novels, the amount which doubled his teacher's salary. So on one occasion, Pasolini wrote to him, if the cinema offers me some possibilities, how can I refuse it? In the tight, incestuous world of Roman filmmaking, 
Fellini and Pasolini had to cross paths. In fact, in 1957, the older established director needed someone to write Roman dialect for a character in Notti di Caberia. Pasolini got the job and delivered in no small part thanks to Sergio Citti. Working on Caberia, he got to know Mauro Bolognini, a man who cast international stars, kind of a George Cukor of the Italian cinema. La Notte Brava, he made Giovanni Mariti from a Roman balcony based on a Moravia short story. Pasolini at that point met an entrepreneur named Alfredo Bini, who said he would produce Acatone after Fellini had seen the trial run of it and said he didn't like it and wouldn't back it. Hiring Pasolini to help with script writing represented no risk at all. He was experienced and understood now to be a specialist in Roman slang and dialect. He was identified with Rome, not the tourist version, but the one that's ignored. The work for Bolognini capped a long apprenticeship in cinema. Pasolini is an example of that adage, how you become famous overnight after a lifetime of work. And that's Pasolini in cinema. In 1961, he didn't emerge from the head of Minerva, of head of Zeus like Minerva, fully grown, pick up a camera and make Akatone. He'd been writing scripts since 1954 and been on the set of at least a dozen movies. He had figured out by then that he wanted to be their complete author. He wanted to be in charge of the total work. The first work then would be Akatone. I want to close with some images and with another quote from his writings. This is Pasolini giving a press conference in Stockholm the last week of October, 1975. He had gone there at the invitation of the Italian Cultural Institute. He spent a week and participated in a lot of discussions about many things. And this picture was taken there and then. The lady on the left is named Pallavicini, and she was the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Stockholm in 1975. He wrote this, I spend the major part of my life on the outskirts of the city, beyond the end of the tram line, as a bad neorealist poet would say, so as to sound obscure. I love life so fiercely, so desperately, that nothing good can come of it. I mean the physical facts of life, the sun, grass, youth. It's a much more terrible vice than cocaine. It costs me nothing. And there is an endless abundance of it with no limits. And I devour, devour. How it will end, I don't know. Here's how it ended. This is his killer in the bottom row, who later, in 2005, said that he was not alone. The boy in the dark t-shirt, the second one, from the left. And there he is, posing for me and other people who are hanging out during the trial, this during a break of the trial. I devour, I devour. How it will end, I don't know. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Very simple. I had a very, very happy academic experience in law school. I thought it was wonderful intellectual food. And then I went to work as a young lawyer and discovered that it was not the same thing at all. And the experience of being a junior attorney after this wonderful, you know, law school 
same one as Bill and Hillary, was the shock. And uh, in 1975, I thought, I got to get out of this. Got to get out of this <laughs> somehow. And I always wanted to be a writer. But you have to have a subject. And I got a newspaper. I lived in San Francisco called the San Francisco Chronicle. And there was a little article about that date that said, and it was November 2nd, 1975. And it was an Associated Press report. Puzzly, body has been found. A 17-year-old boy named Giuseppe Pelosi, who may have been a sexual partner, uh, has been charged with a murder. Uh, Puzzly was an unusually uh, accomplished character who did many things well. And something clicked in my brain. But uh, you didn't know him as an artist. I didn't, know, I didn't know his novels. I didn't know his poetry. I didn't know Italian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't know any better. <laughs> I didn't know any better. That's the key thing. Is to fools rush in. Didn't know Um, thank you very much. It was a wonderful summary of a, a fascinating and um, tough beat life, shall we say. A uh, couple of quick questions uh, about the death and then maybe some, uh, something more tough. Uh, was his mother alive when the son was killed? Yes, she was, and uh, she did not appear at the funeral in Rome. Uh, his body was taken to Casarsa from the Capo di Fiore in a funeral cortege. She was in one of the cars. She was present at his burial there, and then disappeared from sight forever. Very sad never to lose two sons. Yes, um, disappeared forever. Never heard from. Never, never photographed. Never interviewed. Just and then a quick macabre one. Was the body burned or just no? That was shovel. I, I that was blood. Me. Oh, okay. That, that's like dried. Blood. Blood. That like his the head there. That, that's dried blood. And, and they hit him so much in the head that there were chunks of hair on the ground. They found bunches. And so his hair that you look there is kind of matted, is matted with his own blood. It was a kind of massacre. Right. And it's a brain way up. Um, so what would you say was his, uh, he was most, he was obviously very prolific and multi-talented. Uh, where would you say he had the most success? Because I don't know. <laughs> Uh, sort of Roman commercial, the, the arts, I mean, being a, a poet, a screenwriter, and then a filmmaker. Did anybody uh, understand the, the question? I'm sorry, if you can hear me. Or, uh, to, just where would you, did you, would you say he was considered a commercial success or just very controversial and on the outskirts? Because you can publish many things. You can be a communist writer, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think he was a commercial success or was he considered that? Well, here, you have two different questions. Let me answer them in reverse order. He became a commercial success in 1971 with a movie called Decameron, because Decameron fit the early 70s. Everybody was kind of flower power and dope and nudity and orgy and Woodstock, and that made a lot of money. And that in turn made him money. Uh, he bought an Alfa Romeo convertible and certain literary figures who thought that there was nobility in poverty because of the <laughs> high level of their output resented it and said so. Why, why are you driving a car like that? What kind of poet drives an Alfa Romeo sports car? <laughs> and bless his heart, his answer was, the boys I pick up like it a lot. <laughs> and they, they want to go for a ride. What do you say? Then uh, let's go back to the other question about uh, what was he best at. I have a little simple-minded response to that that I'm in love with. And it goes like this. Alberto Moravia was a great novelist, never wrote poetry, never made a film. Federico Fellini was a great director, never wrote a word. Eugenio Montale was a Nobel Prize winning poet, but never made a movie. Um, Italo Covino was a brilliant pro stylist, but never touched a movie camera. So each of them, of those other people, I give a 10 for the one thing they did, and a zero for the other things they didn't do. Pasolini, I give between an eight and a nine for all five. When you do the math, 
<laughs> and you add up the eight, eight, nine, 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 and you divide it by five, and then you take ten and four zeros and divide it by five, he wins. <laughs> he was very good, but maybe not the very best at five or six different things. More questions? Why was he murdered? Why was he murdered? Why was he murdered? Theory number one. Theory number one. Did when they thought Pelosi was alone, it was just a sex encounter that had gone wrong, and the kid overreacted and was angry because his image of himself was that he was straight and he wasn't really gay, but Pasolini probably said something that insulted him. But now that the boy says he wasn't alone and there were two grown men with southern accents whom we'd never seen before, and they beat up Pasolini and killed him, right? and he didn't talk because they threatened his parents, and he waited to talk until 2005 Pelosi, when his parents were dead. The theory about them is, A or B, it's a political killing, that they are far on the far right and are angry at him because they think him as a dirty communist. But then there's the ones who say, no, no, he was killed by the far left because he criticized the left as much as he did the right. Okay. Uh, lastly, there's a theory that he was killed because he was going to publish a novel called Petroleo, Oil, in which, which is 2,000 pages and was left incomplete when he died, but wow. has since been published. And in that, he speculates about a very, very, very famous incident in, in Italian history, which is in 1953, I believe it was, the man who was the head of the National Oil Company of Italy, called Andy, was a man named Matei, uh, was m mysteriously killed in a plane crash. And the problem was that he had just taken the oil company away from the American oil companies and nationalized it. And the theory was that the CIA killed him. And, Pasol and it was never solved. And Pasolini wrote about that. And there's a theory that he was murdered because of that. The answer is, I don't know. Question. Did, uh, um, well, you talked about that the Cameron is a very uh, successful film that made a lot of money. What about Salo? And um, did that contribute to uh, his, uh, his death in any way? Just death. The theory out there is that anybody who would make a film as terrible as that wants to die <laughs> <laughs> or deserves to die, depending on your point of view. Either It's either a suicide explanation. Right? The, the film is a kind of death note. You know, I call it a Liebestod. Or, it's what you get, because you have it coming. The problem with it is that Pasolini had accepted an invitation to a film festival in Chicago to take place after the date when he was killed. He had Petrolio the novel that he was working on actively. He had written another screenplay called Teo Porno Colosso, which was going to be filmed. And he was, had also written a screenplay based on the life of St. Paul. There was an awful lot going on in his calendar for somebody who wanted to end his life. That's the difficulty. How do you, however, conjoin the necessary optimism of somebody who makes plans for the future, because that if you have no optimism, you don't make plans for the future. <laughs> By definition, planning is optimistic. And the things he said and did. And the answer is that he said, uh, the world has gotten terrible, uh, Rome is a place that smells of death, and I'm just trying to get used to it. Where do you want me to go, he said. Where, sh where shall I go? It's fascinating, of course, because it's as though somebody were making a film and he was talking and you were watching it and then suddenly, click, the screen goes dark in mid-sentence. 
That's the best I could do. Any other questions? I'll let everyone talk. If they have none, I will ask anything. Uh, referring back to the first question, um, can you talk us a little bit about the research and process you did? Um, number one, did he keep a diary? Or since like there's plenty published, but what well, was uh, how did how did the research go? How long did it take you to get to book? About the diary, first of all, uh, his entire life work was a diary. His entire life work was a diary. In, in Gospel according to Matthew, the Virgin Mary is played by his mother. That's whom he cast. And he said at the time, in his time, Christ's friends were intellectuals. Why shouldn't mine be? Now, analogizing himself to Christ. This is somebody, you know, who... who he's not modest. He's a narcissist, actually. He, he's a, he's, you know, there's a term for it. He's a narcissist. But I think of him as an or narcissist as somebody who has broken through the ceiling of narcissism to a point where it's irrelevant anymore. Um, uh, as for the research, my job was to talk to everybody. 100 people, 150 people, something like that. Did you talk to his mother? No, I couldn't talk no, to his mother. No, and there was some very interesting bits. His mother's such a, a huge no, right. in his No, no, but, but I talked to his first cousin, that is to say the mother's nephew, who grew up with her. And I talked to her sister, Enriqueta, who's in one of these pictures. Um, and I had some very interesting experience. He had a very close friendship with a brilliant novelist named Elsa Morante. And Elsa Morante, for a time, was the mistress, or maybe married, to Alberto Moravia. And was a very important intellectual, and she's the kind of name that Italians nod, and the Americans say, who? Oh. <laughs> it's just one of those. And, and uh, I called her up on the phone and I said, Alberto Moravia gave me your number, ma'am, and I wonder if I could come and see you to talk about I wouldn't talk to you about pure Paulo Pasolini if you were Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. And the family was charming. The family said, it is simply not possible for an American, and you, you know that America has no culture, <laughs> it's simply not possible for an American to understand the context of I don't know you, I don't know what you've written, I don't know what you've read, I don't know how you're working, I haven't seen a word of your work, but I know that you can't do this. And I'm sure not going to help you to make sure you can. Can I ask? Yeah, can we pass the I just want to ask, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, where do you think Pasolini stood amongst, like, Bellini, Antonioni, and Rossellini. Wonderful question. Where do I think Pasolini stood in among the famous filmmakers like Rossellini, Antonioni, Fellini, and people like that? Uh, I think that he occupied his own island. I think he was kind of like Australia. <laughs> you know? You know and, and, and Fellini was South America, and Antonioni was Europe. I, you know. They, they were like stars that passed in the night, constellations, each doing his own thing, staying out of each other's way. Pasolini never, hardly ever talked about Fellini at all. They didn't get along at all. Um, the way it worked was you made a clique of people that you always worked with. So Pasolini he always has Tonino Delicoli as director of photography. He always has Dante Ferretti as set designer. He always has Piero Tosi for the costumes. He uses the same actors or non-actors over and over and over. Dinetto Davoli, Franco Citti, and people he knew. Silvana Mangano, who was a friend of his, you know. And he brought in occasional outside people, too. But they were a clique that, over and over, like Woody Allen. Kind of. I forgive the analogy, but you know, the same, the same people. Diane Keaton, and over and over and over, right? It was like that. And Fellini had people, his people. And Antonioni had his people. You know, Monica Vitti belongs to Fellini, so Pasolini stays away from her, you know, like that. So it was a technical team and a group of actors, non-actor actors, that were his people. 
Now, there are interesting overlaps because Pasolini was friends with Bertolucci, and, and Silvana Mangano plays Tadzio's mother in Death in Venice, Visconti's movie. It isn't like she signed a contract saying she would only work for Pasolini. His relationship with the new release from the his relationship with the yeah, Italian new release from the Well he's he's half a generation younger. Okay. Roma Cita Aperta is nineteen forty five. And Pasolini in nineteen forty five is only twenty four. So neorealism is winding down. In terms of uh, neorealist influence on his work. Well, it could be said that, you know, neorealism used non-actors, and that that's where he got the idea of non-actors. But I don't think that's where he got it. I think it was his own idea. I think he had a whole, he had a theory that cinema was the language of reality. And you say, what does that mean? And what it means is that people play themselves. He was like, those TV programs, reality TV, 40 years before the fact. So cinema is the language of reality means you don't have actors playing other things. Now, just, just when we think we've got it pigeonholed, we get the idea, got it, Pasolini, non-actors. Just when you figure you've got that, he brings in Silvana, uh, 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 Anna Magnani, who's a famous actress. And he's supposedly committed to using non-famous people he makes a movie with Maria Callas, the only movie she ever made. Did I hear contradiction? Can you also talk about his, his theory on cinema? Is there, no, it's too long a story. He wrote, he wrote book, big books about it. All right, But the, bot, the bottom line of it is that to him, cinema was a language. And actors were like words. And he was arranging them to tell a story. And one of the reasons there's so little speech in his movies, there's some in which all, there's almost no dialogue at all. Yeah. Theorem, Theorem is almost is a silent movie. Uh, uh, which called Eddie Borre and Medea are almost silent movies. And that's because you read the faces. And he was in love with, with close-ups, and you read the faces. And you say, well, I don't read the face. I don't know what to say. He read the faces. To him, that was an important element of his theory of cinema. Is this thing about faces, and that actors are just units of communication. director, François also, he made a film called The Red. And then he, in this film, he, you know, in Theorema, a man came into this family's life, and after that, every, everybody's life has, right. has changed. Right. But in François Ozon's film, a red came into the family, and after that, you know, it's very, I see the parallel between these two films. Right. And I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you think, of, think about the film? I don't know the French film at all. Um, okay. so I'm what, sorry. What do you think about the theorema? What do I think about the theorema? Uh -huh. As a film, mm -hmm. I think that it's wonderful archaeology now <laughs> because it's so dated. <laughs> it's so 68, isn't it? <laughs> don't you think? I think it's pretentious. I don't. Oh, oh yeah. Well, they, they could be that too. He said, he said, that there's a place for pretension and what he called mannerism, mm -hmm. uh, and like that. One of that raises an interesting point. One of the problems with debating with Pasolini mm -hmm. in his lifetime and thereafter is he beat you to it. Before you can accuse him of being pretentious, he'll write, <laughs> even though I am pretentious, <laughs> here's why. Or I sometimes give into pretension, but it has its uses. 
And people were so frustrated because you couldn't have the last word. You couldn't win a fight with him because the way he argued was a kind of totalitarian closed system, like a religious cult in which you don't believe, oh, we know why that's so. We can help you, that kind of thing. <laughs> I think that like, the film we just saw is much more charming than, but then again, it's... What, Mama Roma? Uh, Sparrow, Hawks and Hawks Sparrows. Hawks and Sparrows. Is it yeah. sweet, it's beautiful, sweet. Yeah, yeah, lovely? Yeah, yeah. But thank you for your feedback. I think we have time for one more question. Because unfortunately, we'll have to get ready also for after the, the biography, the, the poetry of Mussolini. So I... There's one, right there. Um, you can stick yeah. Um, about, right. Um, the way you pictured Pasolini, there's one thing that stood out clearly. Um, his stance as an artist made him not affiliated to any movement ideology, right? Um, not, not for very long. Right. Uh, and, well, I mean, he... Kind of in and out. In and out, but not as a whole, right? No. Uh, and, and the second thing that stood out, um, to me is particular attention to uh, outcasts of society. Right? Um, do you think he is still unique as is, or did other people pick up this work and develop it since he died? It's a great question. I think he is one of the artists in this world without protégés. I think there's no school of. I, I think it's sealed off. And it's all, and it all works together. It all hangs together. It all seems inevitable and logical. If you read what he wrote about the change in the Borgata and the rise of consumerism, Salo makes sense. If you go back earlier and you see the church's reaction to La Ricotta, which was condemned, or to Acatoni or Mama Roma, you can see how he's going to show them and make gospel according to Matthew and be more religious than the, than the religious. Everything seems to fit together, but it's all sealed up, I think, with a bow on top, and it's him. Self-contained, self-sustaining, and unique. Thank you all again. Thank you. Would you be available outside? Sure. If somebody has, sure. And also, would like to mention the book has arrived late, but there is a, a mint new book that's been published by the Chicago Press about all Pasolini poetry in, in dual bilingual edition, edition. In bilingual edition, in Italian and uh, English. And the book is available outside. And this was thank, really thank you, thank you to Bart, who highlighted the fact that this was coming out in the US. And we were able to order and have it uh, in time for today here in Singapore. Thank you.